Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll call, can I do the pledge now or just call that? Hey, b uh, before we start, uh, maybe we can do the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Supervisor, can you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to call the operation board uh, meeting to order. Brand, can I have a roll call, please? Thank you, Chair. Director Palacios? Here. Bernal? Here. Huffaker? Absent. Goldstein? Here. Bauman? Here. Ulcer? Yes. Or, excuse me, Uslar? Yes. Ag <laughs> Agator? Yes. Espinoza? Here. Vice Chair Corpus? Here. And Chair Mendez? Here. Thank you. Um, motion to um, pause the meeting. So moved. <laughs> second. Move and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's go ahead and start the meeting. Please I'd like to reconvene the meeting of the operations board. Man, we're a tough group. Um, okay. Um, reconvening the meeting. Is there any member of the public? That would like to address the board on any item not on the agenda. Uh, the board may not take any action on this item. Um, speakers are limited to three minutes. Any member of the public? Okay, seeing now, moving on. Uh, board clerk, any corrections or additions to the minute to the meeting? No, there are not, Chair. Great, thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda. Is there any member of the um, board staff that would like to? Um, Change anything on the consent agenda? Mr. Chair, I, I did have one question about item item nine. Okay, item nine. Which one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, any other, we'll hold up on item nine. Any other item? Any member of the public which, w wishing to address the board on any item on the consent agenda? Seeing I'd like to bring it back to the board. Entertain a motion for items four through eight of the consent agenda. So moved. We move Mr. Goldstein. Second. Second by Chair Spinoza. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed unanimously. Aye. Item number nine, Director Goldstein. Uh, maybe just a few second staff reports so we know what we're talking about here. Uh, sure, this uh, is requesting that the Operations Board um, approve or um, authorize me to um, uh, pay CalCCA uh, $300,000 for uh, fiscal year 2018-2019. Uh, um, that is our dues for CalCCA that split uh, 150000 uh, for the member dues to kind of run the operation of the agency and the other 150,000 to deal with uh, litigation and hiring people that will be dealing with the CPUC. We stand pretty, uh, this is the cap by the way, it's $300,000 is the cap for most of the large members of the CalCCA agency. Um, the dues are calculated based on a specific formula, uh, but it is capped by $300,000. There's, uh, I would say about five or six different members of CalCCA that are paying that much uh, the rest of the membership are paying something less because the formula is um, contingent on uh, the size. Some of it is fixed, but uh, most of the most of the dues are f are contingent on uh, total revenue that the agency receives uh, that that each each one of our CCAs receive uh, on an annual basis. Thank you. So, so my question is is about the litigation portion, and and <clears throat> obviously, you know, there's the potential for litigation. I think involving C, uh, CCAs moving forward, and maybe this is the body to do that. But um, what do you see as the board's role in any potential litigation that would be initiated? Our board's role in, in initiation of litigation by the, the statewide body. Do we have any? buy-in or any role in that or is that strictly um, made by the the forgive me I'm CalCCA. CalCCA thank you yeah. 
I, 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 the word litigation actually is, is not quite descriptive of what that money is being spent on. Uh, generally, any the CPC have many proceedings, and I would say somewhere around eight of them do touch on uh, our, the cost of our operation, and we have to be involved in each and every one of them. These are administrative procedures at the CPUC, uh, and that money that we call litigation is really to spend on on uh, uh, attorneys that file on our, on behalf of CalCCA whatever filings that we have to do respond to other filings that are being made by other agencies and so on and so forth. Um, none of that uh, are activities that, um, that our individual members need to be involved in. Actually, we don't sign off on um, many of those proceedings as, a, uh, as an interested uh, party. We, allow, we leave that to CalCCA to speak on, on uh, behalf of all of us. There are certain ones that we do. Uh, file to be a party to the proceeding, and we may or may not uh, file our individual comments. And, and um, so, uh, so far, I, I, we have not actually involved or got involved into any litigation associated with the work that we do with the CPUC. But um, given the decision on uh, on the CPU on the PCIA, it's quite likely that we may have to do that. So I, I'm fine doing this. I think that obviously we need to be members of CalCCA. I guess the one the one point I want to make, and, and I think this is something just to think about at the CalCCA board, is that, um, and I'll use the, the, the redevelopment agencies as an example, was the redevelopment agencies had a statewide association, which we were all members of, and there were some decisions made during the dissolution of the redevelopment agencies by that, that California Redevelopment Association, I can't remember what it was called, to initiate litigation against the state, which, which at the time appeared to me to be relatively problematic and fraught, and in the end it played out relatively poorly for the redevelopment agencies. So um, just thinking about what role we would have as a board or our policy board would have in sort of these sort of strategic statewide potential uh, pieces of litigation to ensure that we're all moving forward in a way that, that, that with our experience we think makes sense. Thank you. Any other member, any further discussion by the board? Any member of the public wishing to address the board on this item? So you not like to bring it back to the board. What's the will of the board? Move staff, uh, move approval for membership, <coughs> Cal CCA. Second. We move Mr. Go D Director Goldstein, second by Director Huffaker. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Moving on to the regular agenda. Uh, <coughs> Community <coughs> Advisory Council report, uh, Mr. Byron. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Mendez. I'm Jeff Byron. I chair the uh, Community Advisory Council. Um, we met back on October 18th uh, and just briefly going through the items on our agenda, uh, we reviewed uh, our bylaws. It seemed like we spent a great deal of time working on this. I can tell you that a lot of thought and input was, uh, was provided uh, by our, our members. Uh, with the primary emphasis being on making sure we have the avenues for community input wide open and that we're very responsive to them. Um, I think it's also very clear uh, that all members clearly understand the, their role on the Community Advisory Council. Uh, if you will, it's taken a while for all of us to come up to speed on those responsibilities. And uh, we will be presenting that to the Policy Board for their approval uh, in the December meeting. Um, we also received an update on the power supply mix for uh, Monterey Bay Clean Power by um, uh, Director of Power Services, Dennis O'Neill. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear to say this gets complicated real fast. Uh, mm -hmm. That was our takeaway from it. Uh, the, the CAC is extremely interested in supply mix uh, to the limitations around confidentiality, which I think everyone understands very clearly. Uh, and the importance of the role of the, forgive me, uh, is it the uh, Risk Advisory Council Committee? Uh, the Risk Oversight Committee, yes. Um, and uh, Mr. Habash has been kind enough to allow one of our members, uh, actually he requested one of our members be on that committee as well. So uh, I think that's a, a, a really good move to, uh, to have a, a one of those council members there. Um, we also received an update on the go local request for offers uh, from um, Mr. O'Neill as well. 
uh, the, the advisory council was somewhat discouraged to hear uh, the need. I, now, let me, let me back up. And we endorsed the recommendation of staff uh, to hold back on making any long-term commitments to local resources until the staff has had the opportunity to compare the value um, of other uh, Go Local projects. And we were a little discouraged to hear the need um, to slow down on that decision. But uh, at the same time, uh, I th think this is related, and I hope it's not in inappropriate to say so, the importance of the impact of the PCIA decision and the uncertainty around the, the, co the cost and financial impacts that that has. Uh, the, the, the CAC is very interested in these local opportunities for contracting and will be, I believe, you'll see in the future. Uh, we also received an update on the Monterey Bay Community Power Programs um, from the Energy Programs Manager, Beth Trenchard. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, all of those programs, I, I, I want to list them. I, I think they're worth, they're worth noting. Uh, the programs related to EV incentive program, bulk discounts, uh, MBCP public agency and income qualifying customers, purchasing or leasing new or used electric vehicles, the California EV infrastructure program, and, uh, and, the, and the timelines associated with these. Uh, the, the CAC endorses this plan um, uh, uh, for both the Ops Board and the um, Policy Board's consideration. Um, and I think there's a great deal of interest on our committee, on, excuse me, on our council for this. And I'd like to add one additional comment, and that is um, uh, you may be aware of some of the cons concerns that have been expressed uh, in, the, in the electric power industry in this state around the threats that community choice aggregation represents to our um, IOU partners um, and for consumers in the state of, of California. There was some discussion around this a little bit earlier in the meeting. Um, in fact, I, you may be aware, I know Mr. Habashi is, of a letter that was sent to Governor Brown earlier this year from many of the industry groups, um, uh, folks I call, I, I know them well, they're uh, institutional incumbents, um, expressing concerns about uh, the uncertainty on load migration to all these community choice aggregation cust um, organizations and the implied lack of knowledge and expertise that CCAs um, will have in order to address California's policies. Um, I have not found this to be the case. I think this is really a self-serving kind of comment. Nevertheless, um, and related to that is that the, the CAC, we've received some really good presentations and have, have noticed um, a very uh, engaged uh, staff who's responsive to our interests. Uh, very knowledgeable expertise and and extremely dedicated to the goals of, of community community choice energy so I would like to of course uh, uh, in uh, endorse endorse the quality of the staff uh, and and the importance of your adherence to continue to hire and attract good staff so that we don't deal with this issue at the state level I think there is some impression certainly at the Public Utilities Commission and in the governor's office that we don't know what we're doing. Um, and it's, it's incumbent upon us, and I think, I think you've demonstrated that uh, as a, a really excellent community choice aggregation um, JPA, as have the others throughout the state. So um, please keep that up. I think it's important that we have the top level staff that we're seeing here at uh, Monterey Bay Clean Power. That's the end of my report. Thank you, Chair. Brian, any questions or comments for the Chair? Yeah. Great. Any Thank member you. of the public wishing to address the board on this item? Okay, I'd like to bring it back. Uh, I think part of me, uh, Council Member McShane and everybody at the earlier meeting was commenting kind of the success of, the, um, of our CCA, and I think a great success is our advisory council. I mean, that they're out there with the public, and, and I appreciate staff's sort of embracing that role, um, partnership, and looking for opportunities to bring them in, because I think there is a public role there. And I think what's missing in the California debate on energy is why are CCAs coming? Why is there this push for CCAs? Um, I mean, I think that's sort of the big question when all the our current energy policies and procedures and everything that we, uh, legislative environment is not 
helping us meet our climate action goals. It's costing a lot of money for everybody, and it's leaving a real unsatisfying sort of thought among the communities and cities and counties and everybody. So uh, I think, I mean, there's an institutional um, engine there that's trying to stay relevant. And I think the harder they push, the less relevant they're going to become. I mean, I think that's what's kept happening. So that's my editorial. Uh, moving on to the CEO's report, Mr. Obashi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to start by introducing the newest uh, member of uh, our family, uh, Matt Willis. He's right behind me, Matt. Uh, Matt is our, uh, our new um, manager in charge of um, business development. Um, in that sense, he's going to be um, <coughs> working with many of you and the customers that want to start business in your areas to try to find ways to make that happen. Matt, you want to make a quick introduction? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you guys for having me and, and bringing me on board. Um, I've been in energy and passionate about it since uh, prior to An Inconvenient Truth, so <laughs> it's uh, something that I definitely have studied and worked in for probably well over a decade now. Um, like I said, it's my passion, it's my love, and, and I'm here to help the community as a whole uh, become a strong CCA and something that we represent and something that we can take statewide and nationwide and, and uh, hang that as a pillar for, for everywhere. So thank you guys for having me. And I'm here to serve, so anything you need, just don't hesitate to hit me up. Welcome. Thanks, thank Matt. Yeah. Next, I want to update you on the PCIA, and I wish I have an update on the PCIA, but at this point we are, are awaiting um, numbers to come in from pg e that will tell us these two proceedings are taking place at the same time, the power charge and difference adjustment, and that's basically to calculate, for them to recalculate the, the, the PCIA based on the latest CPC decision, uh, which really changes completely the way they've been calculating that, um, that figure for the past um, eight years or so. And two, there's the error filing, which is the, the process that they go through every year in order to decide on what the rates will be. Both of them will uh, impact us, obviously. Uh, uh, the signs are the PCI is going up and their generation rates are coming down, and that means we continuously are being squeezed. When the generation rates are come down, then that's the number we have to compete against, so we have to reduce our generation rates to match. When the PCI goes up, that means we have to reduce our generation rates even further in order to make sure that we stay competitive uh, with those folks. Uh, we, I have seen numbers uh, anywhere from slightly ab uh, uh, above our base case to really grossly over our worst case, and they keep updating them every other day, so um, I'm just going to wait until November 15th when they reveal those numbers and they actually introduce them to the CPUC for approval, then the CPUC will begin to look at these numbers. And finally, we may end up with the final set of numbers by the end of the year. They under no obligation to reveal any of these numbers until December 31st, or the, at least the final number that will be approved until December 31st for implementation January 1st. See how that goes. I will update you as soon as I know anything there will be an update to the budget. Obviously, we have to come back and talk about it to, um, uh, to the, uh, the uh, policy board in December if we can, and certainly in January we'll come back and talk to you folks about it. Uh, well, I also wanna update you on uh, the discussion that we've been having with uh, the city of Gonzales for quite some time, as you, many of you have heard already from uh, uh, from uh, Rene, the frustration that um, he's been going through trying to um, get an energy park started over in Gonzales. Uh, PGE e is giving him some exuberant costs and time that they will have to wait in order for that to happen. Um, they have been looking into doing something internal to Gonzales, and they are trying to work with us on trying to figure out how we can help him in making that happen. Uh, we specifically talk about micro generation or micro grid that will be islanded from the PGE system at least for a number of years until we can work 
with this with the California ISO or with PG&E to make that connection happen to the to the grid. How we can make that happen, it's still we're going back and forth trying to figure out exactly how to make it happen in a way that will get Gonzales to move forward on a business energy park that they're trying to build, and at the same time, uh, that anything that we can do uh, will hopefully help benefit everybody else or at a minimum uh, maintain them at neutral uh, position. Um, that is the update that I that I have for you folks. And if you have any questions on these items or any other, please ask. Uh, any question for our sec executive director? Any member of the public wishing to address the board on this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'd like to move it on to item number 12, approve amendments to MPCP fiscal year 1819 employee salaries and benefit schedules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, uh, I'll start with a, a quick background, then uh, I, will, um, uh, I will pass the mic on to uh, Director Carlos. Um, then he will pass it right back um, uh, when he's done with it. Uh, just in terms of background, uh, I started, uh, uh, as you recall, in September 1st of 2017. Uh, with the intent of launching the program in March 1st of, of 2018, that just barely six months, probably the shortest ever uh, for any CCA to start from yeah, hiring a CEO to actually um, launch in the program. There were two things that I knew that had to be done and had to be done immediately. One is to get the implementation plan in place and submit it to the CPUC, and I, I, I managed to get that done actually in August before I started my 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 first day on, uh, on the job. And the second one was to bring staff in because um, obviously uh, there's no way with that kind of a program that you can get everything done and get ready to launch without without having a lot of people uh, doing uh, the work that this uh, fine staff has been doing so um, uh, effectively uh, for the last uh, year or so. Um, in order to bring staff in, as I've learned the hard way, uh, when I worked at, uh, at uh, uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energies, you have to put together a human resources book. You have to have an organization chart, have classification, job classifications. You have to have job uh, compensation, salaries, and, and benefit all established, which is something that can take other organizations sometimes years to, to put together. We put that together fairly quickly, and, in, and in, I believe in September, uh, in the first meeting that I had with you folks, we had that packet ready to go. Uh, in order for us to do that, I didn't spend a whole lot of time doing a compensation survey to find out how much I should pay the staff. We just tossed a bunch of numbers up there using other compensation uh, schedules from other uh, CCAs and try to do as best as we can just to get moving forward with the hiring. Um, uh, obviously, um, after six months, we've decided maybe it's time now to take a step back and begin to look at the compensation that we are offering our staff to see if, if we are at the right level for each one of those positions. We've been working on that for over six months, and um, and we've uh, talked it over with the, with the chair of the policy board who directed uh, that we need to form an ad hoc group from the operations board uh, and discuss uh, the survey with them and discuss the adjustments that we needed to make. Uh, and um, they would then adopt something to bring to you and um, uh, provided your approval, then the final recommendation will be going to the policy board for approval. By then, I'm hoping that each one of you will be talking to your to the, to the board member on your policy board just to let them know that this has been going through the, a very rigorous process and I've passed and whatever that is that will be the outcome of today's discussion will be it for them to hopefully approve, approve when they meet uh, December 5th. Um, and with that uh, background, I, I will ask um, Director Carlos to, to um, describe some of what the work that was done uh, between last operation meeting and this meeting. Director Palacios. Uh, 
We had a uh, ad hoc committee consisting of um, Director Lane Long from City of Marina, uh, Ben Harvey, uh, City of Pacific Grove, and myself uh, representing the County of Santa Cruz. And we reviewed um, staff recommendations on the sal salary compensation proposals. Um, we spent quite a bit of time on this because we rec recognize the sensitivity of it. Um, but at the same time, it's also um, similar to cities, but also very different, cities and counties, and also very different. <laughs> and so we tried to um, take a lens of looking at it from a city and county perspective, but also looking at it um, from the perspective of our competitors, which are the other uh, community choice uh, agencies. So, um, so we know that the other CCAs are now our competitors in a way for staff, and there's a lot of them near, near us and we're competing with them. And at the same time, we know that we have a, we're all, we all represent cities and counties, and so we have to have that lens as well. So a um, little bit of a, uh, another bit, big piece of background just I want to reemphasize is that uh, we really are, this is our really first time we're really setting salaries with this organization. Um, we have, they currently have salaries, but it was done, you know, you know, because we were in a startup mode. We didn't have a lot of time to do, um, the surveys um, and compensation surveys. So we, we acted quickly, and now after six months, we're doing a reset, and we're really setting uh, a policy for the first time uh, for our compensation. We knew that um, we looked at um, a compensation survey of other CCAs alone, and then we looked at a, a survey that consisted of other CCAs and other uh, and some cities as well. So we kind of looked at both uh, to sort of see where we were at. Um, the problem, uh, there's one big distinction between our uh, Monterey Bay community power and other, and looking at cities or counties, and that's PERS. So when you look at total compensation, uh, this agency is not a member of the public employment retirement system, and that's a huge difference, as you know. That's a huge compensation difference. And so when you throw cities in there, it throws it off kind of, because now you've got this, uh, what used to be 30%, soon to be 58% <laughs> of salary uh, for the, I'm quoting uh, Santa Cruz County numbers uh, in the next uh, five years. Uh, it throws a big um, um, item that doesn't connect here, because this agency is not a big a member of PERS, and therefore it's actually uh, saving quite a bit of money by not being a member of that. So in the end, we, end we decided to go with just the other CCAs, and not include, the, we, we looked at the other survey just as a, a reference point, but our main survey that we're looking at is the other uh, CCAs. We also know that um, none of our jurisdictions, or, or the great majority of them, well actually none of them, none of our jurisdictions, are at the top of our uh, comparable survey list when we compare ourselves to other cities or counties. We know that none, nobody in this agency is you know, at the top, because um, we throw in, we always throw in some people from over the hill and they are always, uh, at a you know significantly higher pay scale than the rest of us, so we know that for most of us we're uh, setting our our compensation levels uh, below if the average if you considered the other over the hill um, uh, jurisdictions. So uh, we l looked at a number of different formulas. We knew we didn't want to be at the top of the formula, uh, but we also know that we don't want to be at the bottom because we know that we have to maintain our staff and we have to be competitive. And we're at a critical point in this agency's history. Also, we're still in a startup phase. Remember, we've only been, it's only, it's been less than a year still. So we're still very much in a startup phase. And even, even though we've been uh, successful, we still have a lot of major um, points that we have to reach with our staff. And so we don't want to disrupt the staff either. So in the end, we um, agreed to look at other CCAs and we agreed to a formula that doesn't put us at the top of the scale, but also is above average as well. It's above average for looking, but it's also not at the top. And so um, Director uh, Habashi will go over the specifics of the formula. Um, Lane and Ben and I uh, looked at it quite a bit, and at the end we agreed to a formula we think is fair, uh, not only to our jurisdictions, but also to the agency, and recognizing that the agency is significantly different from our, our cities and counties as well. Uh, mainly because of the competitive environment they're in and also because of the PERS issue. So I'll turn it back to Director Habashi now and, um, or rather CEO Habashi, and then we will uh, answer questions afterward um, after his presentation. 
Thank you. Um, I, I, I just want to give a quick background before uh, I put the recommendations before you. Um, we, we are operating in a different business environment than, than many other organizations that I've worked with, and I worked for cities for, for nearly 29 years. Um, even in a municipal utility, it, it's very different. Uh, we, um, we have certain goals that pull us uh, up that we strive to do, which is obviously uh, decarbonization, um, lower rates than, than uh, competitors, than PG&E, uh, as well as um, uh, local businesses, supporting local businesses. But we are driven down and pushed sometimes um, by other forces, um, most important of which is um, is the legislative uh, regulatory, which I'm the, we've been speaking about now for, for the last, I don't know how many meetings, uh, they tend to make these decisions, especially impacting our cost and our ability to, uh, to generate revenues uh, to, to work this uh, agency uh, where we want it to be. Of course, we, are be, we have competition between, between the investor-owned utilities and energy service providers who serve customers who are, that they can access directly and they keep trying to enlarge their, the amount of energy that they serve, and in doing so, they take customers away from us, uh, large customers who uh, we usually uh, re recognize or, or get uh, reasonable uh, net revenue from them. And, um, and finally, the energy markets, uh, which can really turn uh, fairly quickly and sometimes in certain hours in July and August, for example, we've seen the price of energy on the market go anywhere f on the same day, somewhere between $30 a megawatt hour to somewhere around $300 a megawatt hour on the same day. Uh, just something happened, a line trips, and, uh, and the market prices just jump up by tenfold, sometimes more. Uh, these are forces that can be, uh, that affect our business uh, uh, a great <coughs> deal, and we have to continuously watch out for and make sure that we are uh, guarded against. Um, <coughs> Uh, the competition for talent here is, is quite fierce for us. The, just a couple of years ago, I, I, in 2016, I was invited to join a group of four CCAs that wanted to uh, form a, a trade association that we now call, we now call CalCCA. That was only um, uh, two years ago. Today, CalCCA have 19 members. And, and about three, four times as large. This is great, uh, good support, but at the same time, it's, it's heavy competition for talent. Uh, all those CCAs would like to get people with expertise in the CCA world, so they obviously go to um, the, the ones that are out there and trying to kind of um, uh, get some of their folks in, and um, that makes it uh, certainly tough on us. Um, that is going to get tougher because now the city of San Diego decided, despite the decision, the PCIA decision, decided to get into it, and now they are discussing becoming a CCA. And this is a very large organization now. This is going to be the largest uh, CCA that is created. Uh, the county of LA, along with the county of Ventura, they are um, now going to go from three cities plus unincorporated LA to uh, adding unincorporated Ventura and 35 cities comes, um, uh, comes uh, January of uh, 2019. Uh, and that's a heavy competition that we are seeing for employees. Uh, not to mention, of course, that the job market itself is, is becoming uh, a lot tougher lately, especially here in the Bay Area. Uh, as, um, as the Director Palacios uh, alluded to, the, the, even though we have uh, same titles sometimes with, with, some, with some of the cities and our members that um, uh, the responsibilities are a little different. For example, uh, our board clerk, she's clerking for this board, for the uh, policy board, and for the CAC, uh, and for the two committees that just got established. And on top of that, yeah, she, she is mindful of, uh, of all my needs, administrative needs, uh, and there are quite a few of them. Um, and that's a little different than, than most of what you see in your cities. You have your own executive assistant, and you, have, you sometimes have a department that, that will hold 
uh, the board clerk as well as um, a number of others that would support um, him or her. Um, Director of Internal Operation, uh, Tiffany is, is handling not just the, the finance issue, finance side or the HR side, but she's handling everything that's administratively support, supportive of the organization. And um, on, on daily basis, she, she has to book somewhere around $700,000 and pay out somewhere around $500,000, and that requires a lot of work and a lot of attention uh, and a lot of effort, and um, uh, which makes her role quite a bit different. Same thing for the administrative assistant, uh, which we use as an office manager and supporting everybody on the staff. We only have a single one administrative assistant. Um, <clears throat> that all the benefits uh, are alike. Also, um, uh, Director uh, Palacios had alluded to that. The retirement plan is strictly 10% towards 401A. Once the person leaves or retires, that stops. Um, there's no, we don't make any payment to Social Security. Neither the employee nor the employer are making any uh, payment to Social Security, and that's uh, quite a bit of savings, even from other CCAs out there. Um, and um, the, the health care insurance, we definitely are paying well, but not as well as many of the cities and the counties out there. And uh, we have a PTO, paid, ho um, uh, paid time off. We don't distinguish between vacations and, and, and sick leave and personal business and management leave and all the other leaves that you are all familiar with uh, that you have probably in your organizations. We just have a single you know, number of hours for PTO and you, you take them when you need them. Um, and that's, that. that's how we differ uh, on the benefits as well. All right, so um, the, what we are recommending eventually leads to an increase of the budgeted amount in, uh, by about $404,000. Again, I want to distinguish, and that comes to about less than two-tenths of 1% 1 of our total revenue. Again, the total budget uh, for, the, for the payroll and benefits, all of it together, uh, comes to about 2% of our total revenue. And, um, and finally, based on actual, because we don't have all the positions filled and we're certainly not paying the top uh, pay for those positions, we, um, the, pay, the total payroll and benefit comes to about 1.6% uh, of the total revenue. Now, and I go back to um, our recommendation. Um, what we're asking for is to approve the adjustments that we uh, included in your packet for all the positions that, that um, we have and um, and that uh, we're also asking for a couple more things. One is to increase the, the insurance premium that we pay to our employees from $1,000 to $1,200 per month uh, to help uh, many of the folks that we have. More, many of them have families, they cover their insurance and uh, the $1,000 hardly comes <coughs> anywhere near um, uh, good enough to cover an entire family, as, as I'm sure you all know. And uh, finally, we are asking to adjust, uh, to uh, we're asking for five days off to close the office in the last week of, um, of the year. Uh, we're also asking that we remove the minimum of the salary range. We, we've done it when we started the same way you've always have it, which is you have a min and a max and you have steps. Uh, we didn't do the steps, we just had a min and a max, then just dawned on us that we really don't need the minimum at all because it, it prevents us from having, uh, being able to hire people at the beginning level where you feel like you don't want to give them the minimum because they just fresh out of school and it makes no sense to hire them and give them $60,000 to do a certain job that they needed two or three years to, of experience to be able to do. Sometimes you want to hire them out, straight out of school eventually and, and have them gain the experience as they work with us. And that's why we wanted to remove the minimum. This way we can hire people even at lower that, at that minimum range that we have set at one point or another. And the last thing is we are not asking for any COLA adjustment. You know, we thought about doing that back in October having been in operation for one year, then we decided against it. We decided to uh, offer the adjustments 
to the employees at the time when we do their uh, performance review. Uh, these are the recommendations, Mr. Chairman, and glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Director Palacios and uh, Director Abashi. Any questions from the board? Mr. Usler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What is what is the total cost of the proposal, including the uh, holiday pay and um, the additional health health insurance cost? And uh, the w we looked at the, the total cost is four hundred four thousand dollars, and that has the salary adjustment as well as the insurance adjustment. Is that correct? No. Um, the four hundred and four thousand dollars is only for the increased salary, no, it's not. It's and okay. then for the um, insurance. For the insurance, will be fifty five k. Okay. Uh, the the extra time off has no monetary value because. It's not like we have to have somebody work overtime in order to cover for yeah. for that time. In the sal proposed salary schedule, um, the M Monterey Bay Community Power Max pay, does this include the contributions to the 401k? Uh, the max, th th we have two, two different numbers. Uh, one that ha we call that total compensation, and that includes all the monetary uh, compensation, which is the 401k, as well as the the health care coverage. Okay, and um, uh, another suggestion: when we call someone an administrative assistant, and the job is actually described as an office manager, I think for for comparison purposes and also for uh, making cost palatable to the public. Um, it, it might be wise to consider renaming the position to what the position actually does because when I look at the salary from administrative assistant and compare this with the city of Monterey salaries, um, that's out of whack. And uh, so I, I would urge, uh, number one, to look at uh, making then the title, adjust the title, adjust your job spec uh, because this is one of those things where the public will uh, love to go into and, and like they go after uh, parking enforcement officers, you know, and, and tell us how much we overpay those. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is um, I understand the logic uh, that, that the subcommittee applied, uh, making CCA special, um, but there are positions in this package that are not special uh, for the CCA, uh, especially in the communications and outreach scenario. Uh, and, and these are uh, position 11, 12, 13, 14, 19, and 21. And I, I wonder why uh, we are uh, considering these positions as special for the CCA if, as a matter of fact, they are just uh, good PR people and uh, they can, uh, uh, it's an acquired trait that they have and, and uh, they can today do this and tomorrow uh, work for our cities. So I wonder why we are. Um, uh, taking these into the consideration as special for CCAs? Um, I, I can try to address that quickly. And, and um, I'm going to ask also JR, if he's still back there, is he? Uh, to come and speak to that. The, the, um, our PR, PR people, yeah, they, they may have, again, titles that, that um, uh, similar to some of the titles that, that you have in your organization, but they are dealing in a different environment. They are dealing with customers who are um, hearing, about it f hearing about us for the first time and learning that we're an organization that we just, uh, that's only six months old uh, and have considerable amount of uh, suspicion about what what is that new thing that we are uh, that we need to offer that that what we have to do for those folks and and the effort that need to be put in in order to uh to um, kind of convince them of why they need to stay with us because those customers also are not just here in some pr they they are making a decision whether they want to stay as our customer or leave and stay with the with the organization that um that they've been with for the last, who knows, 100 years. 
Um, and that requires different set of skills, different set of action that has to be taken in order to keep those customers happy. And considering the fact that we are, by account, have less than 3% of the customers opted out, I think that's that's a heroic effort that, that does require some special skills that we need to um, be going after. They also need to know something about energy and 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 that sometimes it doesn't come easy for people who do you know, PR work and communication work. They really need to understand what, what the energy market is like and how it can change. Um, I'm going to ask JR if he wants to step up and offer a few more. Yeah, I, I just want to say we had a, uh, the subcommittee or the ad hoc committee um, had a lot of the same uh, concerns that you did and questions. Um, so we did recommend that we perhaps look at title changes to better reflect the, the actual job duties. So that was one of the, the recommendations we had. And then the other issue uh, with positions that are similar and that are uh, higher paid in this organization than we would be paying them in our organization. Part of, we looked at two issues. One was there is a little bit of a specialty here because of the energy market, but the other big difference is PERS. And so when you look at, if you looked at our uh, media person and you added the cost of total compensation, you end up actually being similar um, because they're not getting PERS here. And so we looked at, you know, would my communications person want to come here? Uh, for example, to work, and we looked at and said, well, actually, when you take out PERS, it actually, um, you know, right now, take it's a pretty big difference, and we know in the next seven years it's going to be even a bigger difference. And so, with some of the similar positions, we looked at PERS. So, in effect, some of these folks are taking higher salaries, but uh, overall total compensation is not that far off of our organizations because of the PERS costs. Yeah, in fact, I, I would add to that that when we, when we looked at the other survey that had seven uh, seven uh, samples. Uh, two of them were the city of Monterey and city of um, uh, and the city of Santa Cruz, uh, and two were CCAs, and two were municipal utilities, and one was a joint action agency. That was the group of seven that we compared against, and uh, I would uh, I would have gladly taken the the survey, uh, but obviously because the results of that survey turned out to be um, higher. Um, than the one that we've eventually selected, which is only five CCAs. Uh, so I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with uh, Director Carlos that you really need to take the total package into account uh, when, you, when you start making comparison about compensation. Do you have anything else you want to add? Oh, sure. Um, thank you, Chair. This is J.R. Kilgrew, the Director of Communications and External Affairs here at Monterey Bay Community Power. I think the, the I want to echo everything that um, Mr. Habashi said about the uniqueness of the position, but you've also taken into consideration the sheer scale and size of this agency. And if you look at my team, which I think we're eight or nine strong, we're responsible for 270,000 customers over three counties and 16 cities. So when you kind of kind of couple all that together, the level of expertise it takes to be able to engage with customers, whether you're a big agricultural business or a mom and pop shop <clears throat> or a leading hospitality agency or just a normal residential customer, um, to have the background and the expertise and the knowledge to be able to kind of migrate through all those customer bases is an extraordinarily unique trait that is really hard to find in other industries. So I feel like in that particular um, sense, when you look at communication and external affairs, um, it really is a, a very uh, specific but also unique set of skills that you need to be successful that I think, if anything, would make you even more successful in another agency if you wanted to ever lead, which uh, my job is to keep everybody on board and have nobody ever leave this department. But I think ultimately it's a lot harder for people to come into this business as opposed to it is to hear that then to migrate to other agencies and to bring a wealth of information because normally communications positions you don't need as much like technical expertise or whatnot but in this particular case you need a ton of technical expertise to mirror to match with the communication skills which i feel like is a really it's a really beautiful blend that you don't find in a lot of other industries thank you Director Chair. Bauman. so you surveyed five ccas and i assume that they are considered comp 
agencies. So what is our percentile in regard to the average of the five CCAs? Sure, the, the formula that we used was uh, to look at the average of the five CCAs and to look at the maximum uh, being uh, the maximum being offered and to weigh uh, our uh, point to 60 40 60 weighted towards the average and 40 weighed, weighted towards the the maximum and and that's for the total compensation then once we get that number we back out the insurance then we'll back out the the 401a and that's uh, that's what gets us the numbers that we are recommending today uh, I'm not sure that's quite clear. So uh, it, quite simply, what percentile are you in regard to the average of the other agencies? Are you at the 50th percentile, 60th percentile? It, so it would be either direct salary or salary total compensation. So that's w what I think is going to be um, requested of the policy board, because that's how generally cities and counties yeah. will do their, their comparative salaries. The, uh, if the closest to it when you use the when you use the mathematical calculation of, of the word percentile which when we tried it with the ad hoc group they, they basically said you you're going to really confuse the heck out of uh, the board you need to have something a little bit more understandable but the closest percentile to the numbers that you are seeing here is the 75th percentile but it, the calculation itself what it, what it did it weighted it took the average of the five members, it took the maximum, and it basically said we're going to take the average multiplied by 0.6 plus the maximum multiplied by 0.4, and that becomes the number that we looked at. And that's total compensation. The difficulty uh, we faced is that uh, it's a small sample of, of CCAs, and there's one big outlier. So you have one outlier who's our one of our big competitors over the hill, and so if we just chose a strict average, it'd actually be pretty high. So we didn't want to just take a strict average because it, that would skew the results. But we also know they're a big competitor, so we didn't want to just totally discount them either. So, uh, and then if we look at the the bigger group that included some cities, it actually was a higher average because <laughs> of the PERS costs. It actually skewed it up. So that's why we wanted to. So that's why we looked at the 60% of the average, but then the 40% of the highest which is the outlier, basically. So it's in that 75%. We're about 75% percentile of the um, average of the, of you include all of them. But that's the difficulty is uh, because of there's an outlier, we would, uh, our choice was either to throw them out and then just take a strict average, which we would, normally that's what I would do, right? And our, we would just throw out the outliers, the highest and lowest. But because it's a small sample size, we couldn't really do that. And then we also know that they're our biggest competitor being Silicon Valley clean energy, and they're paying the top rate, and they're our biggest threat to steal our employees. So we didn't want to throw them out. So we ended up being this complicated formula, 60% of the average, so we're slightly above the average of the lower paid one, and then 40% of the higher paid one. We came up to the middle, which is about 75 percentile. Thank you. All right. That's probably a question for Tom. So. I think we're fortunate uh, to benefit from an excellent uh, team of staff, uh, especially in the startup mode that we've been in. Uh, but out of curiosity, and I, and I think as part of these discussions, I think it's all of our interest of wanting to uh, ensure we maintain that competitiveness going forward as well. I'd just be curious though, for the recruitments we have done, um, what sort of candidate pool have we had? And how much interest have we had in those recruitments? Have we struggled with filling the positions? And have we been satisfied with having a a qualified candidate pool uh, for the recruitments that we've completed. Uh, in some cases, we we um, didn't struggle much. Uh, in some cases, we have struggled and uh, and put an ad out twice. I know that, for example, we are trying to hire an HR uh, person. We interviewed a bunch, uh, and we're gonna have to go out again. Uh, um, I will be probably going out for the th for the third time after changing the title a couple of times in order to try to find. A person that that will fit what what we are looking for, uh, the manager of legislative and regulatory um, uh, uh, affairs is, is a very difficult one to hire, especially at the rate that we had before. That's probably if you look at the uh, if if you look at the schedule before you, you're going to find the largest increases coming to that position uh, because you need somebody who is likely to be a lawyer. 
uh, to take on the regulatory work that we do uh, with the CPUC. That I've been having a tough time trying to fill that position for I would say over eight months. Sometimes you don't even bother trying to hold interviews because whatever resumes that we've received are just not uh, uh, not um, uh, qualified, at least in my opinion, to to move forward with them. In some other cases, things went okay, and we were able to fill in the positions. Things are becoming a bit tougher lately. Uh, one, because there's just so many CCAs today. All of them are competing for the same talent. Uh, uh, and two, because the market is just becoming tighter and tighter. Uh, Director Goldstein. Um, a sort of a pragmatic question. If if a uh, if we increase the health benefit to twelve hundred dollars, uh, and somebody is only a single person and only using the, the single person's health care plan, what happens to uh, presumably there's plans that are less than the twelve hundred dollars? What would happen to the delta? Do they get it in cash or does it use it or lose it? They they, they don't get it in cash. They just get what um, what the health plan that they picked okay. will pay, and that's it. Okay. Uh, secondarily, I think looking at this, one of the ways we usually look at this in terms of cities is is um, the change in total comp, you know, for the employee base. So, is are we talking about a fifteen point five step up? Is that is that an accurate number for the for the, the total compensation? If I, I look at you know total salaries today and then total salaries when this is done. Yeah, I think the question is is the did we go up by about 15% from the old compensation to the new compensation? Um, it's about 15.5, yes. Yeah. Is, so, so is the plan to phase that in at all, or is this effective um, January 1? Uh, this, the only thing that it does, it, do, it doesn't increase any, anybody's pay. What it does is just to change the number that we're going to have in the budget that accounts for uh, salaries and compensation. Uh, people's pay today is going to stay the same tomorrow. Uh, some of them will be uh, reviewed uh, December 1st. Others will be reviewed in January, February, March. Whenever they came on board a year after they started, we will have a review of their performance, and then we will offer um, an adjustment then. And it's unlikely that any of the employees that we have will be adjusted uh, to the point of going beyond what we have today as the maximum co compensation. Does that make sense, Jamie? I, I think so. I, so So it sounds like nobody's pay is going to change. It's just the range changes for the positions. So subject to their next evaluation, there's a potential step up. That's correct. So, so OK. Any other member of the board have any questions or comments? OK. I, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Um, it's a little uncomfortable to talk about those topics, especially with employees in the room. Um, I think uh, I cannot vote today, uh, even though I'm just the alternate and Ben Harvey was part of the ad hoc committee. But I feel uh, personally right now it, it would make sense for me to find another modus and uh, another way of discussing those salaries. Uh, is I, I don't know, but but I uh, I feel there there are some more questions that, that I think we we have the we have to diligently explore uh, in the interest of Monterey Bay community power and especially the PR that that it will receive and and so I'm I'm just asking is there another way of, of maybe um, uh, continuing this item right now and and uh, having a an ad hoc committee meeting again that I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking. Well, I mean, that, that's a question that we can address, but let me just kind of go over it. Do you have something else you want to share? I, I think Hans is referring to how normally personnel matters such as this would be a closed session item. Yeah. Typical labor negotiations are appropriate for closed session. This is more of a policy setting. What is the, the direction of the operations board with respect to a salary policy um, that they want to apply that would then apply that policy um, to individual positions? As has been noted by um, Mr. Habashi, this isn't about any one person's particular salary, although it, it down the road will certainly impact um, the authority and the positions in the authority. But 
is it appropriate for closed session? Probably not if there's the will of the board um, to gather more additional information in an ad hoc setting and come back. Um, that's, that's the prerogative of, of the board, certainly. Uh, we did ask that question, and the uh, answer we got was that there's not a labor. Uh, Brown Act is that it's a negotiations with a labor group, and there's not a labor union here. So and I think we the so idea, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, the idea was uh, was to form the ad hoc group so they can negotiate in closed session w or and talk to the staff about what's the best approach to uh, to make the adjustment and. In your last meeting, you have voted to form the the ad hoc group uh, that was made of the three directors to do exactly that, which is to go in closed session and, and talk to the staff about this. Uh, but eventually, at the end of the day, um, whatever changes that has to be made need to come to an open session for approval. If I may. So as Council has pointed out, perhaps this should be presented as a compensation philosophy. So we more clearly identify the CCAs that we have identified as our comp agencies. And if we need more because of the small sample size that uh, maybe not here, but in the future that we add those and that we identify that we are marking ourselves at a particular percentile. You may have a formula or, or, or a formula with an explanation of it. But this, the way it's presented, and I'm saying this as it goes to the policy board, simply looks like it's salary increases when I think what council was saying is, is that we're attempting to adopt a compensation philosophy. So I think this should be framed in that um, context. Yeah, we're, we're adopting in effect what we would consider a salary schedule, and, um, but not individual salaries. So we're setting a a salary schedule, and if it, although it's not a strict salary schedule, as it's similar to what we would have, the way that they're using they're using a control point in effect. And so, have you identified clearly which CCAs were used? Uh, we d he didn't put them in here, but we have yes. them, so we Happy can put them in the. Yeah, good. We yes. can do that. My suggestion is when that goes to policy board that you do that, and then that you have some additional clarification of what the formula is, and how it. Um, approximates to a percentile and I, I would just add to that I think to lose point embedded in this is a is a comp philosophy right what percentage do we want to target how do we want to approach these conversations going forward and that's that is embedded in the schedule that we're discussing and, and I believe there, there's times when it's appropriate to talk about a compensation philosophy in closed session perhaps not and we can get clarification on that um, but, uh, but an important piece of this conversation is uh, going forward, uh, what approach do we want to take? And it's more than just putting a, putting a schedule together, I believe. Okay, be before I ask for a motion, because I am going to see the seek direction from all of us, um, not just play the what if scenario, because, and it's not, it's just not fair. And I get it that we're struggling with this, but I think moving it forward, we did form an AHA committee of our colleagues to kind of look at this. And we could provide direction, we can say, we can make recommendations with ad hons or whatever. So uh, before I sort of open up to the public. I, I think um, I agree with you, Mr. Chair. We should, it's really a schedule we're adopting based on the, the latest information we have compared to the uh, available CCAs that are up and running. I think uh, what we can do is expand the adoption of the schedule with a uh, form uh, recommend to the policy board and to our board uh, an adoption of a committee that will look at total compensation philosophy uh, as we roll out any other further adjustments, but I think it's fair to go ahead with these recommendations with a caveat that we are going to look at the uh, future near and long term with a, uh, a, <coughs> a focused policy derived from both the operations board discussions and from the policy board finally so that we don't run into the issue of trying to make it up as we go along as some of you have pointed out. Uh, I think that may leave some concern about the salary issue because it's a schedule we're adopting not we're, we're not adopting raises at this point 
Uh, those are handed out individually by the appropriate staff and by the CEO. And that's where it should be uh, based on performance, as I understand it. All we're saying is this is the range. So at this point, I agree with the range, but for the future, we're sitting, we need to have a policy committee and an operation committee discussion on what that further policy should be in the future as far as pay. Well, uh, if it pleases the, the board, I, I, I think the, the policy direction has been to, uh, to a reasonable extent provided by the ad hoc group, which is look at your salary survey, uh, look at your, your, your sample uh, of the CCAs, don't look at cities or, or counties or other agencies, look at only a sample of the, uh, of the CCAs, uh, look at the max and the average, and here's the formula that you can use in order to set uh, to set your your max pay for your for your uh, staff. Uh, I think that's the philosophy if that's what you're looking for, or, or that's the policy if that's what you're looking for. But uh, in addition, I think we when we go to the policy board, I think we need to have the new schedule in there because that new schedule is based on that philosophy. If that is the philosophy that you all agree to. Common. So I, I think uh, to Ray's point and in, in to, to Tom's point is embedded in this is the compensation philosophy and what I was recommending is is that that's articulated more clearly that here's the compensation philosophy and this is the resulting salary schedule and I would also suggest including I don't see it here um, the range because it just has the max here and as you pointed out so I'm not suggesting that we don't go forward today, but that we just articulate it clear, clearly that this is the compensation philosophy, the reasoning for it. We want to be competitive. We're at the 75th percentile, and um, here's the associated ranges. Um, there's a couple of things it seems like uh, we're sort of mixing up a little bit. One is the methodology in, in, in pieces, which uh, to me makes sense, you know, where you had to choose between the uh, cities versus CCAs um, uh, in terms of the comparative uh, agencies. Um, and, and again, I feel comfortable with that and what the ad committee came up with. And then where the philosophy comes in really is then where do you set that range which you just outlined, which is that uh, where you came up with that methodology of the 60-40 uh, which makes sense to me because you're right. When you have such a small sample size, how do you how do you do that? Uh, and then that that's really what derived then the 75 percent. I also feel comfortable with that. It seems reasonable, um, but maybe just clarifying that in the explanation and moving this forward. Uh, and then with respect, to I think the minimum isn't there just because I think that's one of the recommendations, which is to uh, not have a minimum at all. Except. Uh, that that's a correct uh, as I understand it they don't have a uh, traditional salary steps like we would and so they have a max salary and then uh, which is what we're approving and then he basically sets a control point and hires people uh, and gives raises in a more flexible way maybe you want to say how you do that yeah um, uh, certainly we you're correct we we have not adopted the range with the steps of you know, so much percent, uh, and I, I don't have to tell you, you, you all, uh, uh, city managers and, and uh, county executive directors, and you probably, uh, some of you, not all of you, don't like this steps idea, and sometimes would rather um, uh, give increases based on people's performance as you see it. Um, and that's the philosophy that we, we are adopting, that, that raises will be provided based on performance. Uh, uh, and we can put an upper limit on it, but, but we have not thus far. And so far, um, uh, and that's why we don't want to have a minimum, because it really doesn't help us, especially if we want to hire somebody straight out of school, to have a minimum that will be higher for the kind of pay that you want to pay somebody straight out of school. You just want to keep that minimum but nothing. You know, this way when you bring in somebody and you want to give them just basically what 
every other person that just fresh out of school gets, and that's what you do. Um, then move them up as you see fit and as, you, as they prove themselves uh, in the future. That's why we said we want to do away with the minimum. We're just going to have the maximum. Everybody that we're going to hire will be paid definitely less than the maximum. Uh, then moved up to that as time goes by and as they prove to be uh, the right people for the position. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm more than glad to actually uh, have that as the, as the policy for how we want to approach uh, the hiring, uh, how we want to approach giving raises, and how we're going to calculate the compensation in the future, uh, which is that 60-40 approach that we've, that we've spoken of. And we can, when we present it to the policy board, we'll pre present it as recommendation number one, approve of this philosophy of how, to, how we're going to go about uh, making uh, adjusting our compensation from year to year and two it will be approved of this schedule which is based on this uh, philosophy that we just shared with you Director so, uh, I, I think you're referring to a broadband that would be zero to max yes sir. And so you probably want to articulate that of course okay uh, before asking for the will of the board uh, any member of the public wishing to address the before I ask the public director also Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, I say this with uh, great respect to my elders um, in the ad hoc committee. Um, just because we had an a hoc committee, Chair Mendez, does not mean that, that there might have been not an oversight or an error on the side. So I uh, want to acknowledge that there was very good work done by the ad hoc committee. Um, I still believe that the communications and outreach um, is, is, is not different from any other communication and outreach that we have in public agencies. And um, I, I feel um, that, that uh, I still have not completely grasped uh, with, with respect to those positions why um, the product they sell is so much more special than any other uh, director of communications doing uh, across the, uh, our county, um, like for tourism or, or other things. So um, just wanted to have that registered. Great, thank you. Clearly, we, we have difference of opinion, which is good. That's healthy. And I think as part of the success of this agency uh, early on that we were able to work through a lot of these issues. Uh, so um, any member of the public wishing to address the board on this issue? Hi, Seth Capron. I was just curious what the five agencies were that were used for the comparative study. Yes, um, they are Silicon Valley Clean Energy, MCE, Peninsula Clean Energy, Saloma Clean Power and Clean Power Alliance. Thank you. Any member of the public? Hi, Ellen Hoffa, um, City of Monterey. Um, boy, I, I guess what I would r encourage you to do is you've heard some feedback from your colleagues here, and uh, I think some of that feedback was really well, well put. Number one, that maybe there are some positions that could be reclassified or should honestly be reclassified. Number two, um, you, you want to be competitive. We want to be competitive. And that does mean, in some cases, competing with other, um, other CCAs. But in other cases, it really doesn't. One of the things the city of Monterey did it, when we were looking at our class study is there are certain classifications where we're competing against you, and there are other classifications where we're competing in the Bay Area, right? So that is a really important determination, that there are some job categories where you are competing in a larger region, and there are others where you're competing in a more local one. And where I think, as Mr. Uslar is um, trying to, to point out, where there really is, is not a significant difference between that job category and one that is being done by your staff. So I would encourage the subcommittee to take the feedback you've heard and uh, discuss this and bring it back um, after having some more discussion. A couple of other questions. There's 19 CCAs. Why these five? Maybe why not all 19? Um, and then I just got a, the dose of reality is you can say this isn't a raise, you can say this is a kind of reclassification that people will get when the time comes, but the public will, and your employees will all see this as a 15% raise. As we go into negotiation with our employees, 
in each of our cities and jurisdictions, they're going to see an agency in the area that it got, got a 15% raise. That's how they will see it. So please bear that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public? Okay, bringing it back to the board. What's the uh, pleasure of the board? Well, I would move that we uh, approve the amendments to the FY 2018-19 employee salary benefits and schedules as recommended by the ad hoc committee and that we reflect the language that uh, Director Bauman has suggested in terms of the compensation for the last fee. And, um, and if there are additional uh, uh, questions on, on uh, the policy side, then I think those can be taken up by the policy board. But that's the motion. Okay, there's a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. I'm going to move the second by our policy. Any further discussion? I'll just uh, point out a couple of things that um, uh, we made this a little bit more complicated in the subcommittee in that um, um, the uh, CEO actually presented a, per a straight percentile number to start with, <laughs> and we, we didn't actually like the results. And so we made, in, we made him go and do this comp more complicated formula because we like the results better, even though it's harder to understand. So we'll take uh, part of that blame uh, for us in the subcommittee because we're trying to uh, micromanage a little bit of the of the outcomes. Um, it's a complicated uh, system. And the other thing is that if we had made it very simple and just taken a combination of CCAs and cities and did total comp and just took a straight average, we would be much higher off. And so we, st we, we cause, uh, and it's because of the purse issue, right? And so we, even though for the public that would be an easy way to understand, we decided to go into this more complicated fashion. And I know it complicated for everybody, but we thought the result was a little bit more fair on the individual basis, but we'll certainly, we agree that there's some ish positions that uh, we need to look at, and I think that'll be a further con uh, conversation with the CEO. Thank uh, you. Director Usler. Thank you. Uh, I will vote no, and I just want to explain why. Uh, first of all, uh, the administrative assistant is not an administrative assistant. So we heard it will be an office manager or is an office manager. I would say we should not vote on an administrative assistant salary if this is a, d is a different job than it was is in the salary schedule. Number two, uh, I cannot agree to the communication outreach positions as I outlined uh, because I, I don't see a difference there. Uh, I respect the CCA uh, comparison logic that was used. I think that is appropriate, but I, I feel uh, we if we take a vote, it should be uh, on a, on a uh, complete and uh, uh, if I say perfect, it's the wrong term, but it should be on a complete pa package. It should reflect what was being discussed and presented by, by the CAO. And uh, for that reason, I will vote no. Okay, thank you. Any other further question? Okay, I'd like to call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. One opposed. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for working through it. think that at the policy board level. Uh, so again, I think it was acknowledged. Uh, this is a little awkward for us, but by no means did we reflect, this should be taken by staff as a reflection of your great work. There's been a lot of good work done and, to, and we recognize it and you've been put in a lot of untenable positions sometimes along the way. Uh, right. So we, I think I speak for the entire board that we recognize and appreciate all that. Thank Director. you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make two, two points, um, just to address two issues that, that um, now have been made. Uh, one is is the issue of needing to change the job title in order to and the classification of needed uh, to reflect uh, the actual job that the person is doing. I, I believe that's correct, and I plan to do it before we even go to the policy board. That is something that we can do w without actually needing to go through the process of, of asking approval. So we will change the, the, the title to make sure that we have the word energy when it in anything it has to do with communication because it is, I, I, I do believe, that requires a, an additional set of skills to, to, to understand the energy market uh, clearly and to understand the CCA market versus the investor-owned utility in order to be able to communicate the issues that we need to communicate. Uh, also. Uh, to answer the, the question that uh, uh, that uh, Director Allen have uh, posed earlier, why these uh, five CCAs only when we have 19? Many of the CCAs that we have are smaller cities. Uh, all of them are done in Los Angeles, and they all 
uh, have they all operate under the city structure so they're not actually a, a joint action agency like like us uh, same thing uh, could be said uh, for the city of san jose for example they, that's why they're not in a survey because they are a city so they have a director that handles the uh, that uh, that reports to the city manager it's a department of the city so they don't have their own administrative services or their own anything uh, they kind of just part of the city and um, and that's why we picked the ones that we picked uh, there's uh, no other CCA that was out there that we didn't uh, try to uh, tap into uh, that was anywhere near our size um, uh, there was only those five uh, hopefully in the future there will be a lot more of them but but uh, that's all what we had it was not it was it was not an easy in some cases we actually had a sample of only three or sometimes four because some of the titles that we had w didn't have any similar position in in uh, other CCAs like uh, Sonoma for example so um, hopefully that will address the two points that were made earlier thank you okay thank you director any uh, other board member reports or comments okay seeing none meetings adjourned thank you